Murders, Mysteries, and Conspiracies with author Glenn P. Klinger III is presented by the Florida Pickleball Clothing Company. For all your pickleball clothing, go to floridapickleballclothingcompany.com. Now, with today's murders, mysteries, and conspiracies, here is author Glenn P. Klinger III. Hey everybody, this is Glenn. I want to welcome you to yet another installment of Murders, Mysteries, and Conspiracies. If you are a returning listener, I want to thank you for that. If you are a first-time listener, I want to tell you that this is the place you can go where we talk about specific events, whether it be a murder or mystery or a conspiracy. I'll try and give you information on both sides of an event, and you can go out and get your own information and try and make up your mind so we can either solve a mystery or at least get a better understanding of what is happening in the world around us. Now, I'm not a historian and I'm not a detective. I don't claim to be a little disclaimer I like to lay out there. Today, we're talking about um, elections in America. And I was speaking with somebody the other day that was of the mindset that elections in America had never, never had any type of fraud or illegitimacy. Now, I wanted to look at that because I didn't know. And I wanted to get an idea. I hear you hear a lot of things on both sides of this topic. I really don't care what your political affiliation is. I really don't. It doesn't matter. to me. My main thing is I'm going to give you the information where you can make up your own mind as to whether the claims of these people. I'm just trying to get to the bottom of it. And together we will do that. I was fascinated to find that there are a lot of contests in America that were very contentious. I was going to give you some examples of times when uh, elections were questionable, some of the reasons why they may be questionable, some things that may impact the election. As my former professor at Florida Institute of Technology would always tell me on a regular basis, you know, those who don't remember their history are bound to repeat it. We are going to look back at some of these events in history and see if we believe Things have gotten better, or if these things still happen in America. Now, the most contentious election, there were several, but one of the most contentious elections was the election of 1824. In that election, there was four presidential candidates, John Quincy Adams, Henry Clay, Andrew Jackson, and William Crawford. And after the War of 1812, there was a long era of Everybody feeling good. They wanted to help each other, get the country going in the right direction. And a lot of these people were members of the Democratic Republican Party. They worked together. They even served on each other's cabinets and did those kind of things. But these are type A guys and they want to be elected and have a chance to run things. So when the election happened, Andrew Jackson ended up winning the popular vote uh, with 41% of the voters, but he did not win the electoral college. In that case, it goes to the House, and the 12th Amendment limited the House runoff decision to only three people. Mr. Clay, who was the Speaker of the House, got bumped, and it only left three people. They eventually bumped Crawford and got it down to John Quincy Adams and Andrew Jackson. When the states were reporting their votes, the Kentucky legislature put forth all of their votes for Andrew Jackson. And that's what they told Mr. Clay that they were going to do. Mr. Henry Clay decided he wasn't going to do that. And he talked to the delegates and talked them into voting for Adams, actually talked to some of the others in the House and got them to vote for Adams. Jackson was shocked when he lost that election. And Clay didn't like Jackson. He didn't want him to be the president. So pretty much did a workaround and found a way to to take it away, the victory away from him. Adams and Clay, Jackson called them out for being corrupt and making a corrupt bargain, he called it. And it was so bad that he left the Democratic Republican Party and formed what is now known as the Democratic Party. So Jackson ran as a Democratic candidate in 1828 for the presidency and won convincingly with the majority of the votes they needed because he ran on the platform and he was going to clean up the cap. He was going to clean up and help it run, run it more from a common man's perspective, which is, which is good. When you think of corruption, a lot of corruption starts at these local levels, small elections, works its way up. And 
A lot of you may have learned about an organization named Tammany Hall. I learned about that when I was in junior high or high school, one of those things, history. And it's an organization that had a lot of political clout in New York. It was a big organization that was backed, backed mostly Democratic candidates at all levels of government. The population of New York swelled considerably due to the potato famine. A lot of these people, thousands and thousands of Irish folks fled uh, Ireland and came to New York and they were living in pretty bad conditions. And so they became acquainted and got involved with these folks at Tammany Hall because by 1855, Irish immigrants comprised about 34% of New York's voting population. And many rose up in the ranks of Tammany Hall. One guy in particular, a Scots Irish chairmaker from New York City's Lower East Side, his name was William Tweed. They called him the boss. He entered the world of politics at the age of 28 as an alderman, and he ran on the Democratic ticket. Tweed was elected in 1852, and his power continued to grow. In 1856, he was elected to the Board of Supervisors, and by 1860, he headed the Tammany Hall General Committee. Tweed actually started a law firm, although he was not an attorney, and charged legal services, which is illegal, to people. In 1868, he became a state senator, and he immediately started rigging elections. Uh, he committed voter fraud, and he relied on intimidation tactics by street gangs called the Dead Rabbits to ensure that his cronies were elected in positions like mayor, governor, and Speaker of the Assembly. His downfall started when he began making fraudulent leases and ordering unnecessary repairs in order to launder money. And he did that and made tens of thousands of dollars uh, in, in city funds. So they basically caught the guy and finally New Yorkers got tired of him and ended up putting him in jail. Tammany Hall underwent several revamps and revivals. They tried to keep the organization around, but it never fully recovered from Tweed's exploits and it lingered into the 20th century before closing its doors for good in 1967. So I think that serves as a cautionary tale of unchecked power. They let this guy get in control. He started taking money, stealing, became greedy and, uh, and hurt a lot of people. So as we flash forward a little bit to 1864, now what a lot of people didn't realize that a few months prior to the 1864 election, Abraham Lincoln penned a very pessimistic prediction of his political future, saying he wasn't going to get reelected. He was running a tough campaign against George McClellan, and McClellan was you know, a military guy. And leading up to the election, Edwin Stanton decided he was Lincoln's secretary of war, that all of these soldiers should get the right to vote. And so he allowed mail-in ballots. Now, those things are still contentious today, and they're usually rife with fraud when they, when they are sent out in mass. But there was a million military soldiers that would be allowed to vote by mail. And uh, McClellan, being a military man, Lincoln figured that he was going to lose. But you have a lot of other ways people can, you know, can impact elections. Mr. Stanton employed the power of the War Department to bring military voters in line, making sure they voted for Lincoln or um, face some pretty harsh penalties. There was um, the Secretary of Defense dismissed 20 quartermaster clerks who had endorsed McClellan and, and talked badly about Lincoln. So there was a lot of things going on, jockeying for power and all those things in addition to that. But Lincoln secured 78% of the military vote. Only 150,000 soldiers voted. And, um, but he got 78% of that vote. A lot of these people felt their vote was disenfranchised because, um, a lot of people didn't vote. They didn't feel the way that they were voting the way that they wanted them to vote. So that wasn't the first time that absentee ballots were used for soldiers. Pennsylvania soldiers were able to submit their absentee ballots in War of 1812 if they weren't around to vote. And New Jersey passed uh, similar legislation, but it was repealed. 1820. There's a lot of fraud that can happen with mail-in ballots, and several guys were actually arrested during the Civil War. And one of the worst examples 
was 20 McClellan supporters had forged signatures of active duty enlisted wounded and dead soldiers and officers that never existed. And those were sent in shipping crates. Uh, and these shipping crates full of fraudulent ballots were actually counted in New York. A New York uh, military commission tied the group's ringleaders uh, to those ballots uh, two weeks before election day. These guys got life in prison for tampering with an election. So they didn't play around. Now, after the Civil War, uh, blacks were now allowed to vote in the South. And Democrats wanted to control that. Because a lot of the, the blacks were going to vote for Lincoln because Lincoln's a Republican. He freed slaves. And so they would bring these guys out, these paramilitary groups called red shirts that were used to intimidate, try and suppress the black vote and give advantage to the Democratic candidates. Between 1865 and 1900, there were 262 disputed House elections. Most occurred in the states of the former Confederacy. Flash forward to one of the biggest debated elections is the one in 2000, Bush Gore. You remember Americans learned not to trust polls. Many news organizations relied on exit polls um, before they could get instant feedback like they get now. And it wasn't telling the story that they looked at exit polls in the state of Florida. Uh, they called that state for Al Gore. That wasn't the case. George W. Bush had 246 electoral college votes and Mr. Al Gore had 266. So Needed 270 to win, so it was very, very close. Came down to only 537 votes to win the state of Florida. And that one was the famous hanging chad. They had those, those ballots that were, you had to punch buttons and it would knock out a hole in the card and then they would read the card and those things were hanging on that wasn't getting clearly marked and they said that, that was the problem with that. They had to recount the ballots for the state and the federal courts. And it went to, finally ended up going to the Supreme Court that voted to give the victory to Bush. The Supreme Court was split 5-4 with the conservative justices in the majority, and they delivered the outcome win for Bush. Many people don't realize the Democrats tried to dispute the election and presented a resolution on the House floor, but those resolutions had to be supported by a a senator and nobody signed, no senators signed to support the resolution. So it, it failed. And anytime you have these disputed elections, it it's, divides the nation. The one half that voted felt like their voice wasn't heard. The other half feels like well, they won, even though if it wasn't fair, who knows? I mean, it's just, you can only look at these things and try and determine what actually is free and fair. In the modern day system, you've got voting machines and there's companies that run these voting machines. And uh, there's a great article in Scientific American Magazine from 2018 that says uh, vulnerabilities of voting machines in America. Now, these folks did a mock election between George Washington and Benedict Arnold. They had three volunteers. Each volunteer voted for Washington. But these Memories in these machines, the memory card was, was infected with malicious software. So when they printed out the results, Arnold won two to one. And there's no type of paper trail. If you're just pushing a button, there's no way of knowing what you put in is what they're reading. There's no way of checking it. There's no way of going back. Even the person auditing it would have no way of knowing what was actually put in by the person voting. So it's really not a good thing. You need to have checks and balances. And it's pretty scary that 20% of voters nationally still cast their ballots electronically only. These electronic ballots only. They don't have any type of paper ballot to fall back on. So that's not good. And there was another instance in 2018 when Beto O'Rourke and Ted Cruz were competing for the Senate seat in um, Texas. A lot of the votes... For Beto O'Rourke, some of those were switched to Ted Cruz. People were complaining that their votes were being switched. And, and it happens on both sides. People were complaining that in certain elections. I've heard that too. People's votes were being flipped the other way, back, forth, and on each side and weren't being accurate. And we need to have an accurate count. We need to have, if it's going to be fair, people's votes need to be counted fairly. And we need to know that, um, that these things aren't happening. Now, election officials can be dishonest. You can have, uh, a foreign cyber attack could be the biggest problem in the world if that ever happened, if there was any way they could get into these 
to these machines. Now, uh, they have some of these machines that use these USB sticks, and that can provide a route straight into the machine with malicious code that can spread through a centralized programming system and, and infect the system and cause the votes to go any way they want, any way somebody wants, however they've got the code written. And 79% of votes across America are, are recorded on a piece of paper, and the remainder are not. So there's no trail, like I'd mentioned earlier, to go back, and there's no way to perform any type of rigorous audit. And 20% is a, is a lot of votes. You know, 14 states still have gaps in their ballots being recorded on paper. And I don't know if you knew this, but Georgia is an example of a state that, that's entirely paperless. They are using voting machines with software that hasn't been updated and had a security patch update since 2005 at the time that this was written. Now, it may have been done since. But so the election's coming up. It's important to know that these things are done. And there's lots of ways that you can manipulate elections. And one of which is you can impersonate a legitimate a, a voter. So maybe somebody's died, uh, lost their right to vote because they're a felon, or remain registered and just not voting. So you vote in their place. It's the voter rolls are not cleaned up. And a lot of the instances, that was one of the big disputes in the 2020 election is a lot of the voter rolls weren't cleaned up. So you may have people that could vote. So you've got one person voting twice. So you have to really think and wonder if that's happening. Now, there's times where people will make up phony names, fake addresses. Uh, you'll see these people that the address is an empty parking lot and they'll just register and, and go by and, and vote for these people. Buying votes, giving people money for their vote. That happened years ago where somebody gives somebody you know, $20 or $100 or buy them a drink and they would tell them you vote this way for me. What's really unfortunate is people that at polling locations who intimidate people in line, they have to be a certain distance from the voters. They can't be in line telling you, hey, you need to vote for this person or that person. That's not fair. That's uh, voter intimidation or taking advantage of elderly people, elderly, the disabled, the illiterate, those whose English is the second language telling them to vote a certain way, or you need to vote here, or I'll help you vote. And you tell them you need to vote for this person. And a lot of people don't realize the media, the impact the media has. If you have candidates, um, say you have candidates that both of them have issues, the media needs to talk about the issues equally. If, for instance, the media talks about one candidate more than another, that can, can sway the vote. A lot of younger people get their media and their news from their phone. Well, if, for instance, you hear something on television about one candidate and you put it in your phone and you start reading about it, well, the algorithms are such, and you know how it works. If you're out there shopping for something, it'll start sending you examples of those things, trying to help you find what you need. Example, same thing there. If you go in there and you pull up one candidate, maybe the things that they're doing wrong, you're going to get hammered constantly hammered with things about that candidate and the things that are going wrong. That can sway your opinion. And these people need to think about that when they, when they do it. A lot of people don't understand that there's a lot of different cases of voter fraud. And I'm not going to bore you with a lot of these details because a lot of these things have been going on for decades. But there's a great article from 2012 when they talk about the integrity of voting machines in the national election and how to rig an election. It was in Harper's Magazine, November uh, 2012. And it talks about computer balloting, the need to verify the ballots. And, and a lot of that, the, the computer voting was brought on by uh, the media. As I mentioned, the media wants immediate results. They want to be able to call these elections. They want to touch a button and bring you to the big screen and, and tell you that who's winning the state and call it three hours before the election's even been tabulated completely. You know, they can do it as soon as the polls close. They can dump the data down to them. So that's it's not a good thing. You want to have a paper trail. You want to make sure every vote's counted and counted the right way. You could have people that hack into these elections, these computers, and steal millions of votes in an instant, flip means of votes, change votes. It's baffling. And let me give you a couple examples. Now, there was a guy named Chuck Hagel. And Mr. Hagel ran for the Senate seat in 1996. And initially, he was trailing Democratic Governor Ben Nelson, who had been elected in a landslide two years earlier. In a poll conducted by the Omaha Herald, 
it showed the race in a dead heat. But on election day, Hegel's victory in the general election was stunning. He just routed it and it handed the seat to the GOP for the first time in 18 years. And Hegel trounced him by 15 points. And they even factored in the governor's deteriorating poll numbers and last minute barrage and negative ads, but they wondered what changed it. Now, Americans didn't really realize it before the election. Hegel was the chairman of a company whose computerized voting machines would count his votes. So he had been on the chair of American information systems and he did step down two weeks prior for announcing his candidacy, but he still maintained millions of dollars in stock. And so that company was counting his votes and Hegel won an astonishing 83% of the vote with the largest margin of victory in statewide race in Nebraska. Now, another instance, John Kerry lost to George W. Bush and on election day, Kerry showed an insurmountable lead at exit polls. Considering his victory had all been certified, except in 30 states that widely deviated from the exit polls, discrepancies favored Bush in all but nine. The greatest discrepancies were concentrated in battleground states, particularly Ohio. Now, in one Ohio precinct, it predicted that Kerry should have received 67% of the vote, but the certify tally gave him only 38%. Now, the odds of this happening and occurring in a sample are one in 867 million. So, obviously, there's something that's not right here, something that's out of the ordinary. But a lot of people think, oh, this is too big to, to rig. But I'm telling you right now, they can, anything can be manipulated. Like I've said uh, a number of times, I don't care how, what affiliation you have. I think that all of our votes need to be counted uh, fairly. Um, I never lose sight of the fact, and I hope you won't either, that people fought and died. Some of my relatives fought for this country. Some of yours may have fought and died for this country to give us the right to vote and make this process free and fair. Keep that in mind as we move forward this election season. And I hope everything in you know, this great country, we can have free, and fair elections and the people that serve us can be the ones that we want to serve us. I hope you enjoyed today's talk on murders, mysteries, and conspiracies on elections and whether they are fair and a little history lesson. But until we meet again, this is Glenn, and I'm going to thank you so much for tuning in, and I hope you will listen to my other uh, podcast. I've got some things on YouTube now, uh, shorts, uh, two-minute mysteries. I hope you'll like and subscribe to those, and uh, I will keep punching those out. I'm going to try and put these on YouTube also in a podcast format. So if you want to listen there, you can listen there. And, uh, anyway, everybody have a good day. This is Glenn. You have been listening to Murders, Mysteries, and Conspiracies with author Glenn P. Klinger III, presented by the Florida Pickleball Clothing Company.com.